Great. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. We will start with our presentations about 12, but just before that begins, I want to give you a brief introduction to this event. This is the COVID-19 IQP presentations, and I'm Peter Hansen, professor at WPI and director of international and global studies. Today is May 12th, 2020. This is an auspicious date. As uh, 50 years ago today, on May 12th of 1970, this is when the WPI faculty began debate for the WPI plan. This threw out <clears throat> the older set of requirements that WPI had used for uh, since its founding in 1865 and embedded real world projects across all four years of the curriculum. And most importantly, it put students in charge of their own education. Students and faculty became partners in this educational endeavor. The WPI plan created a new normal in the 1970s. They gave themselves two years from the adoption of the WPI plan in May 1970 before adopting seven week terms in the fall of 1972, pass fail grades, which later became graded, and required projects in the humanities and arts and in the major field. One of the real innovations of the plan was to create an interdisciplinary third year project, the interactive qualifying project that was at the intersection of science or technology and society. <clears throat> Those projects created by this, the WPI plan are what we will see today in its current form in the 2020s. We don't know yet what our new normal will look like as we look a little more look ahead, but this is what we have. Um, in March, 2020, there were 300 students and faculty who were preparing to get on planes to fly across our global network of project centers that looks something like this map. It within a matter of days, just before the end of the seat of our term at the first week of March, that map turned into the early version of this map. This is the map today, representing the spread of the novel coronavirus and the COVID-19 disease. The students you'll hear from presenting today were planning to travel to Russia, Denmark, India, and the United Kingdom. Other teams across the, among these 300 students were planning to travel to Armenia, Australia, Ecuador, Germany, Greece, Namibia, Paraguay, Romania, and two locations in the United States. Literally across six continents, students stayed home or stayed in their rooms, wherever they were located, were not able to travel to these locations and instead did projects remotely. Faculty and students adjusted quite rapidly and did an amazing job of finding new projects where necessary, or sometimes continuing the ones they had planned to do remotely. So these projects that we'll hear more about are just the tip of the iceberg for what the COVID projects are at WPI. The Humanities and Arts Department at WPI is collaborating with the Worcester Historical Museum to create an archive of coronavirus, uh, the COVID-19 chronicles of the stories from around the city of Worcester and how this is experienced today. And it is truly something we will be talking about for generations. There are projects in preparation right now that are completing their preparation to be launched into continuation of work this summer on the responses to this crisis in France or in China. One project in China, for example, will be working with partners in Wuhan and Beijing, looking at the use of mobile apps to combat the spread of the virus. There've been major projects in students' major fields, si simulating <clears throat> the coronavirus in Wuhan or modeling the healthcare system in the US and the different stresses this disease puts on it. There have been many projects in the humanities and arts, in history, religion, literature, so forth, in which students are engaging with what social distancing means in different con in today's contexts. And the Global School, which was scheduled to be launched uh, over this um, month and the next, 
it provides an opportunity for us to look at ways to collaborate across our global project network. And this term has forced us into modeling what some of that can look like through these coronavirus projects. Many people who are viewing this probably are well aware of how the WPI community has responded. Some of you may not be, but the community has responded magnificently to these challenges. Many people donate all the personal protective equipment from their labs to local health uh, care agencies or hospitals. Many members of the community made masks, which have also been distributed. The 3D plant printing plans for various protective equipment have been distributed to locations in Africa. And our president, Lori Leshen, is on the Massachusetts Reopening Advisory Board, which even within the last 24 hours is help setting the stage for what it will look like for us at WPI and more generally in Massachusetts to reach the stage that we will call our new normal. As we make this transition back to the new normal, there's a lot of research on campus that's directing itself to the challenges of this present day. How do we model the coronavirus or the interaction with potential vaccines? What are the kinds of point of care solutions that can be offered to hospitals and healthcare providers? And the social implications of this disease are a, an intense area of interest for many faculty and staff at WPI. I've also had the pleasure over the last uh, month to read some of the pandemic stories that have been submitted by alumni to their class notes, especially from the class of 1965. And as I've read about the experience that they have gone through and some of the similarities to that which I and other students are going through today, it has called to mind something that this set of presentations and these our current situation provides us we have today, through these presentations, the opportunity to celebrate our community amid the pandemic. We know from our own experience at the WPI campus that social distancing will not mean no social community, even on those, if there's limitations for our physical engagement with one another. And then even if commencement or reunions or other events have been postponed, this does not mean we're not able to celebrate. And today is really a celebration of the accomplishment of these students. Earlier today, President Leshen sent me a message to asking me to convey from her to all the students and their advisors her congratulations. And I'm very happy to do that. It's a great accomplishment to have reached this stage in this term. And I will just tell you a few minutes, some things about the format and the schedule of the presentations, and then we'll get to these students. A set of presentations will begin in a few minutes with the first one at <clears throat> beginning at 12. Following this kind of schedule, there is versions of this schedule pu published online on the WPI website. There'll be a break in about an hour at one o'clock. After the short break, there's another set of four presentations that will take place until approximately 2.15. And at that point, we'll have a chance for some broader discussion after the event as a whole. The format of these presentations are that each team will present their work for approximately 10 minutes and to allow five minutes for discussion for each project immediately after that presentation. If you have questions for the team, please submit them to the chat feature in Zoom. Apart from the presenters, the microphones for the attendees will be muted and uh, we'll ask you to, if you have a comment you would like to make verbally to hold it until the end, but if you have questions you would like to ask each team, please submit them to the chat. So with that, we will resume shortly. I believe we're going to be ready to start in a couple uh, minute or two. And I will end sharing the screen. But I just want to finally again welcome you to the coronavirus presentations. I'm Peter Hansen. And I'll be serving as the MC uh, of the event to introduce the teams. So we will get to that first introduction shortly. Thank you. Using dynamic models and empirical COVID-19 data to showcase pandemic prevention features. I'll let the team introduce themselves and as soon as I can stop the share. So go ahead, team. All right, uh, can everyone see my screen?
Uh, thank you for that introduction, uh, Professor Hansen. Um, so we'll get right into it. I uh, just wanted to say at first um, that this project was a joint collaboration between WPI and the Financial University of Moscow. Hello, everyone. We are Russian third year students from Financial University. My name is Olga. My name is Astra. My name is Karina. My, my name is Anna. Hi, everyone. We're the WPI students. Um, my name is Matthew Whittington. I'm an aerospace engineer. Uh, my name is Cade, and I'm a civil engineer. My name is Ivan. I'm also an aerospace engineer. And our advisors uh, for this project were Professor Nikitina from WPI and Professor Krovin and Professor Losif from the Financial University. Uh, to start things off, we're just going to go through a brief outline of what we worked on during this project. Uh, we started off by researching six target countries, the United States, Russia, Germany, Italy, South Korea, and China, and looked into the different response protocols that they use to mitigate COVID-19 spread. Additionally, we looked into their um, viral and infection data to keep track of their successes in doing so. We then use this data to create predictive models in an effort to forecast what the coronavirus spread would look like in these countries, which proved to be a relative, relatively difficult task. Um, throughout the presentation, you're going to see um, a documentation of the models that, in an effort to do this. Uh, we later switched, switched to adjusting our efforts uh, to emulate smaller pandemic situations as more of a learning tool for people to understand uh, how to combat pandemics. And lastly, we used uh, the information from our models, as well as the successes we saw in certain countries to develop a set of recommendations for governments to follow in efforts to prevent pandemics. And those recommendations will be shared at the end of the presentation. So the US was slow to respond to the pandemic and now they're the leader in COVID-19 cases in the world. South Korea was very quick to respond to the threat and they conducted a huge amount of tests and were able to plateau a lot sooner than any other country. Um, Italy took a while to respond to the virus, and this caused them to have the highest mortality rate. Russia was not quick in responding either, but their quarantine protocol is strict with uh, the virus epicenters located in overpopulated areas. Um, China enforced probably the strictest quarantine protocol, uh, which was the reason um, they have also seen the plateau of new cases sooner than others. Germany had um, a big testing campaign, which allowed them to show um, a smaller mor mortality rate and keep their elderly population safe. So our goal was to simulate how coronavirus is working in six countries and to calibrate the coefficients using real data from our six countries. Any logic was our instrument to imitate different models and see how fast did it spread and is quarantine measures are working or not. We collaborated our model coefficients to make our model show a real situation, but we faced some difficulties with collaboration. It was because the data that we had collected earlier wasn't full and some coefficients were really hard to calculate using not enough data. Then you can see our third model where H means healthy, E infected, R recovered, and D dead. But the low cal calibration accuracy leads us to unrealistic results. The next results you will see in the next slides. The next model we moved on to um, still focused on calibration around real world data so we could predict um, certain virus numbers. Uh, but again, inaccuracies led to uh, inaccurate models. And we turned a corner on being able to produce models that were interactive and could be used as learning tools. So this model is a SEER model. It focuses on susceptible, exposed, infectious, and recovered um, people, and it's graphed those in uh, the graph below. But the sliders that you can see um, allow us to vary the infectivity and the contact rate that a person would have in a population, um, which will evidently change how the virus spreads. So the higher the infectivity and the higher the contact rate, um, the more the virus will spread. And the less you put the sliders, um, the less it will spread. That was used as the first learning tool that we have.
While our American colleagues were working with any logic modeling, we would like to introduce you some ways of predicting the spread of the virus using econometric approach in MS Excel. Graphs on the slide illustrate the relationship between the number of infected people and number of days in the start of the pandemic. From the first graph, we can see that exponential growth is well at the beginning, which is typical for the start of coronavirus outbreak. At a later stage, logistic growth describes the data better as after the increasing growth, it starts to decrease. Gamma distribution is also one alternative way to predict the spread of the epidemic, but it provides a slightly poorer description of data as after plateau condition, it works worse for predicting the trend. Uh, so next approach that they used is moving averages approach. Uh, so they wanted to have a really uh, good approach while previous models have a really uh, significant differences. The moving averages approach was the best uh, forecasting approach that they tried. Formulas you can see on the screen. So next slide. So test cho. Um, helped us to understand whether there is a structural stability of arrivals in this model. Um, this statistical test assesses significance improving regression model after dividing the original sample into parts like before implementing a quarantine and after. Uh, so for all countries, the hypothesis of changes cannot be neglected. It's rather fierce. For Italy, Germany data is not stable. Russia's way of treatment is not efficient. Uh, because uh, numbers are infected only increasing in South Korea uh, is also uh, neglected. Uh, for SA, probability is rather small, less than 5%, and only for China, the data is structurally stable. Dependencies do not differ. The probability of accepting the hypothesis is more than 5%. Uh, so the next approach they tried is the econometric approach. So they wanted to, to uh, see how different factors affect uh, spread of, uh, of uh, COVID-19. So they tried with eight parameters. The best of them is total number of tests for COVID-19 uh, in each country and population density. You can see uh, our graphs on the screen. They have a more significant effect to the uh, different numbers of uh, total uh, infected people in each country. So uh, the next approach is a sigmoid model. Uh, you can see how it's calculated. It uh, had uh, uh, four steps uh, of application. At first, they applied uh, uh, that the, there is a number of infected people, which is, uh, depend on the number of contagious people. And then they added uh, some other steps. Uh, such as uh, they added uh, the 20 days infections uh, uh, rates, uh, they added uh, uh, infected uh, contagious and susceptible uh, differentiation of people. Um, on the third step, they added uh, self-isolation, and uh, you can see how the graph looks uh, with only self-isolation, it grows really fast. Uh, comparing to the fourth step, then they apply quarantine measures. You can see that it's exactly like it's a theoretical model. Uh, so it's a really good prediction. And as you can see, it looks like it's not a big difference between two graphs, but the difference is uh, 200,000 people, which is really significant. This is the next model we looked at, and it again focused on uh, using a model as an education tool and a display of what happens when you vary contact rate in a given population. It wasn't based on any um, empirical data, but uh, what we used was an agent-based model, which allows you to look at individual people in a population and um, predict the spread of a virus in a given population with specific assumptions on the infectivity and contact rate. And here we can see that quarantine is instituted in two different populations, seven days and 21 days after an initial infection. Uh, the left graph is the 21 day infection uh, or quarantine. And as you can see, it has a much higher peak infected individuals. Um, and the right graph is the seven days and it has much lower uh, infected individuals. 
Um, so in light of uh, all the models we worked on, as well as the successes we saw from different countries, uh, we were able to develop a set of recommendations for governments to follow and for future pandemics. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, governments should institute national quarantine protocols to limit contact rates. As many of our models demonstrated, uh, as contacts are cut down, the spread of an infection is slowed drastically. Um, additionally, one thing we learned um, from monitoring South Korea's success was that contact tracing when done in conjunction when widespread testing is an effective way to contain virus spread at the beginning of a pandemic. Uh, a key word here is at the beginning of the pandemic, which leads us into the third recommendation. Um, since at the beginning, viruses during in a pandemic spread at an exponential rate, whatever protocols a government does institute should be done quickly and promptly at the beginning so that infections can be cut down right from the start. So um, our team used multiple different approaches to um, view the problem and we decided to compile all of our work on a website. Um, there's a model section where you can see all the different models we went through um, as well as the recommendation section with um, the recommendations that we developed and the country comparison section where you can see all the different statistics on the countries we viewed. Um, this concludes our presentation. Um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat and we'll take some time to answer them. Thank you to the team. <clears throat> As I said, if anyone has questions, thank you very much for keeping to time well for your presentation. Um, I have a question if uh, no one else does. Uh, you mentioned at the end your recommendations for quarantine and contact tracing and early intervention. What, is, what does a good quarantine look like? Um, are there particular features that you would um, identify as, as ones to be prioritized? Because some it seems that if, if you look in the United States, different states seem to do it differently. So from your the models, do you have any recommendations about a, features of a quarantine? Um, so there are a few different uh, kinds that should could show success. Uh, one being a complete uniform quarantine uh, where a federal government um, institutes it nationwide and promptly from the beginning of the pandemic. But another aspect, um, South Korea actually um, used their quarantine um, in conjunction with the testing and contact tracing and were able to do targeted um, quarantines um, for individuals who were in contact with people that they tested to become infected. So doing that promptly at the beginning of a pandemic would also be effective. Any other questions from other people? Well, I'll ask one, uh, maybe it's not a quick question, but what did you learn from working with each other across the Russian and American teams? Uh, Ivan, you want to take this one? You know, I really enjoyed it. It was really interesting. They made a lot of uh, models, they discussed everything. I didn't know so much about the coronavirus before. And um, while I was trying to make some impact, I read so many articles. So it's, I feel like it's a really good experience. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you to this team. We can. Uh, uh, I'll offer our uh, applause to them. This is a very nice presentation. Thank you. It really Thank got you. us off to a good start. So um, we'll get the next group queued up. And this title is Transitioning During COVID-19 Student Perspectives. And the team can uh, begin to share and introduce yourselves. All right, so I'm Olivia Latanzi. I'm Nick Bogiana. And 
I'm Megan McCool. And we are an IQP group formerly going to Denmark to work with an environmental nonprofit, Econet, that supports sustainability initiatives through community engagement. We were on the brink of getting on a plane when all of a sudden we had to reorient our efforts. As our abroad experience was uprooted, we understand the losses many students have faced in the wake of COVID-19. Now we are examining its impact on higher education from student perspectives via survey and interviews. In a survey to WPI students, we posed the question, how do you feel about the changes made due to COVID-19 in two words? If students were feeling how we had felt at the time, this would largely consist of shock, disappointment, and stress. And it turns out this prediction was correct. Mainly students were disappointed, shocked, disheartened, frustrated, upset. We then posed the question, and what about now? At the time of this survey, this would have been less than a month out from when all these changes were made. So we see the same sentiment of sadness and disappointment, frustration, stress, boredom, but on the whole, students understand these changes needed to occur. And our group wanted to investigate why students had the reactions they did and what part class year, major, or learning style, and some other factors may have played in this. So as Olivia mentioned, in the beginning, we were learning that we were not going to be going to Denmark around the same time that we learned our project would be radically changed. As these changes increased from in-person classes during D-term to being completely online, we began to wonder how these changes would affect other students' education. So we aimed to survey WPI students and interview them to understand their perspective on how the transition to online learning was and how they currently feel about everything. Along with the WPI data that we were going to collect, we also wanted to look at how other schools handled it. We looked at other schools in the New England area, these schools here, due to their difference in majors, structures, and cultures, and to see how they compared their, their responses to WPI's response. So from our survey results, students at WPI are now learning all over the world, with one respondent remote in Turkey and one in Hong Kong. Students are spinning across the United States from the east to west coast, with the majority of students staying in the northeast. So with our survey, we have gathered responses from all class years through different means, such as the class Facebook pages, emails to various groups, messaging clubs on social media, and reaching out to personal friends. We were able to collect responses from varying majors as well, with the largest group being mechanical engineers, which we did expect as WPI is 18% ME majors. So in total, we collected 298 survey responses from WPI, which we have then analyzed. At the beginning of the presentation, we showed word clouds of adjectives describing how students felt about the decision. We could see the change in how students felt about the situation after time, but to really get a concrete answer from students, we asked them plainly how they felt about the decision WPI had made. 94% of the students agreed that this was the right decision to make. And that really painted the picture for the rest of our responses that we got to the other questions. So the next few questions on our survey were based around the transition to online learning and the classes now. We began by asking students how they felt WPI had adapted to online learning. 64% of WPI students agreed that WPI had adapted well to online learning. Through our interviews with students at other schools and at WPI, we saw that opinions of the students on the transition was impacted by the timing of the decision and on what resources were available for students and faculty to move online. One of our biggest takeaways from the survey was when we asked students how they felt of the quality of their online classes. 83% of students agreed that their classes were not of the same quality as their traditional in-person classes. A change in tone from previous questions where students felt that we had made the right decision and the tradition as well, made this point a major thing where our interviews with other students were very critical. We found that many factors affect how students feel about the changes including how their classes are now delivered, whether it be in-person Zoom lectures that were regularly scheduled or pre-recorded lectures, the type of classes you were taking, whether they be labs or projects, what major you are, and what learning style you have, which we'll discuss later. Classes where participation or discussions are a major part of them, suffer from the online format, as we found, and we found that students appreciated when teachers put in the extra effort. As we've touched on earlier, we thought it would be important to investigate learning style. We wondered if some students would be at a greater disadvantage online because of their preferences. 
We focused on Witkin's theory of field independence and dependence, which distinguishes one's heredity, life experience, and the influence of personality as a key player and how successfully they learn in a particular environment. COVID-19 causing a change in environment made us believe that this theory best fits the current situation for students. And the idea is that people may need more external motivators and collaboration in a learning environment over others. The strengths of field independent learners tend to be favored in an online setting as their confidence and efficiency allows them to better navigate new technologies and environments. We were able to draw some interesting comparisons based on the student response. We also wanted to investigate if feelings of quality varied by types of learners. And though there are more self learners who feel they are getting the same quality of education, there still appears to be a general tr trend that WPI students feel the quality is less. However, in various interviews, we got an understanding of some of the nuances particular students have had based on learning style. Here's a quote from a Northeastern University student describing how she relied heavily on her friends in completing work. She notes how important her friends caring about her doing well plays a part in her motivation and efforts in school. Someone who requires more social interaction and motivation from others in their learning environment would gen generally be described as a field dependent learner. And even though independent learners are better at defining goals for themselves and creating their own motivation, they still have found difficulty in this new environment regarding having no in-person connections. A student from Emerson College described himself as a self-learner, but still noted how hard it is to focus at times without being in person. And some WPI students explicitly mention how their learning style requires a more social environment. And with online learning being very impersonal, it's important for instructors to foster discussion and interaction as best they can to accommodate the needs of the many field dependent learners at WPI. Several of them made note of what they have felt helped them succeed online in, this, in these times. Optional Zoom lectures taking place synchronously if lectures mainly consisted of pre-recorded videos, having the option to work by themselves or within a group on projects, receiving all assignments at the beginning of term or at least well ahead of time, which allows for more structure and predictability, and option, optional office hour Zoom calls with professors. Many students expressed an appreciation for instructors who made the extra effort in communicating online and acknowledged how this transition has been an equal, if not greater, challenge for them. So 61% of WPI students agree that their work is negatively affected by their current living situation. When looking at where the students were living, students who lived on campus were more satisfied than anyone else. The reason for many people having their work affected is because some students have had to pick up jobs since being home, personal reasons related to COVID-19, and other reasons such as not having adequate Wi-Fi to support their new online environment. So to summarize our data, the main takeaways are, at every school, students were initially sad and disappointed about moving online, but they are now more understanding. The quality of education has decreased in the online environment, Learning styles affect students' work progress online, and in order to best satisfy all students, they prefer options to choose what best suits their learning style. The schools which provided extra time for the transition and adequate resources for both the professors and students had a smoother transition to online. Students are not only affected this academic year, but they're uncertain of their future, whether it's their internships, jobs, or next year's schooling. We don't know exactly what is going to happen in the future, but our results are very beneficial for what may come. It is undetermined whether a term will be on campus or remote, so our results can be utilized to receive a more positive response from the student body and improve online learning quality. If a terms IQPs are to be conducted remotely, they may also choose to expand on our results and dive deeper into many different areas. Crisis communication can be further developed and improved based on a result of how students were affected and responded to the announcements and decisions that were made during this pandemic in case of another future crisis. So we wanna thank you and do you have any questions? And while we're answering questions, we're gonna have a few quotes and other information that we've collected show on the screen. Thank you. Um, if you have questions, please share them. I've seen messages from people directly to me saying this is incredibly useful information and asking if it's being shared with uh, some of the central WPI administration. And we certainly will uh, share that. I can pass on those contact informations for you. So not having seen any questions yet, 
you interviewed people from other schools and surveyed and interviewed people at WPI. Were there any significant differences across these schools? For one part, um, the, the timing of spring break did have an effect. We know, I know that uh, students at Northeastern had already come back from spring break when they were told that classes would move online and they were told they had to move out. So having uh, a lot less time to prepare for it when you're told on a Wednesday that your classes are online tomorrow and then you got to move out in two days, is it as easy as being told over oh, spring break that, hey, you can't come back? Here's a question from Professor Rissmiller <clears throat> saying you might not have looked at this directly, but would you expect a different response from students who are completing projects online versus typical coursework? So there was a difference. Um, people who were completing projects um, online tended to be um, more disappointed than people who were completing um, typical classwork because the students who were able to do the typical classwork online, they um, they had a smoother transition than the projects had it more adapt or um, MQPs, for instance, some of them were just canceled altogether and they were writing reports on what could have been. Um, and IQPs, as we all here have had a transition. So there definitely was a difference. And many people I think were very disheartened with not being able to complete the IQP abroad. A lot of them talking about how this is one of the big reasons you go to WPI is because of that abroad IQP experience, which is really unique. And so having prepared for that for well over a year, at least knowing about it for well over a year was, um, was very difficult in the transition to remote projects. So I think I have time for one, one more question. Um, <clears throat> You talked about a term potentially online. If this happens, do you have any ideas or recommendations about who, how schools should navigate the transition knowing what we know now? I think the, uh, the way it happened with D-term where everything was changing so fast was a big factor in how people felt. Because as for us on a Monday, we were told we're definitely going. Then on Wednesday, we told we're not going. So the difference with a term is that there's a lot more time that you can prepare students and you can prepare classes and that sort of thing. So it would hopefully be more smoother transition rather than a, hey, you're not doing it anymore. And another piece was students wish there was a more empathy when the announcements came out. So they think, so next, in A term, if it was to be online, um, students would probably like more empathy with, with the notifications and classes themselves can adapt um, like, where we were talking about learning styles, um, they can have supply different options to the students so um, they can choose what best suits their learning style. Okay, I'll just observe this comment was made and then we'll have to probably move on. But a question was about whether in the surveys you were asked about whether this was emergency online learning, which is how some specialists might characterize what we've done, as opposed yeah. to just online learning. Um, so um, we'll have to leave that thought and uh, thank this team again for a very nice presentation. Thank you. So the next team up in line is analyzing the effectiveness of remote labs at WPI. You can introduce yourselves then we will, you can begin. All right, hi everyone. Um, we are the IQP team um, originally going to Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, and we decided to analyze the effectiveness of remote laboratories over this remote D-term. My name is Erica Wentz. I'm Pat McCauley. I'm Zachary Newlon. And I'm Peter Zollinger. Um, as a lot of us have realized throughout this uh, remote D-term, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed all forms of education. And our team wanted to specifically, specifically look at how labs were being affected by this transition. Um, so we, to do this, we developed three different objectives. We developed an objective where we'd look at the student transition and gather student perception, perceptions based on a survey that we sent out. We wanted to talk to faculty and interview them to understand the challenges they're facing transitioning their classes online. And based on these last two objectives, we developed an analysis um, to determine the most effectiveness of remote laboratories 
throughout the remote D term. Some of the classes that we looked at are listed on the screen. We wanted to have a variety of different classes ranging from lower level introductory level classes and some higher level classes as well. We decided to group these into three different groups, chemistry, physics, and engineering to preserve the identities of the professors we were talking to. The professors helped us send out this survey um, and we had a variety of different responses. Some of our students were taking a variety of other classes as well. So we got responses in another category that you'll be seeing later on in our results. Most of the chemistry classes that we had been interviewing and looking into had been doing recorded pre-recorded lectures with some narration over it in a live Zoom recording. We had physics lectures that were doing online simulations with some circuits and wires and things that they could drag around on their screens. And then our engineering classes were doing a variety of the two, as well as some at-home labs that students had been shipped materials for. So overall, students had a slightly negative opinion towards their online classes. Uh, with 51% of our 200 survey respondents uh, saying somewhat or extremely negative, and then uh, about 30% saying somewhat or extremely positive. However, when we asked specifically about how their transition to online labs uh, was going, that number increased to 55% of somewhat or extremely negative with a slight decrease in the somewhat positive and neutral categories. Uh, however, the big takeaway is that only 10% of our server respondents had an extremely negative view of online classes, but 22% of our server respondents had an extremely negative view of online labs. So even though the general opinion on online classes is only slightly negative, the general opinion of online uh, labs specifically is significantly more negative than just online classes. When we break this data down by the class year of the student respondent, uh, there isn't much trend other than the uh, general when we look at class year specifically. However, transitioning to uh, remote labs, uh, that question has a distinct trend where more experienced students uh, are more dissatisfied with the lab classes they are taking. As you can see, nearly 50% of our surveyed seniors ha have extremely negative views on the lab classes they're taking. Uh, we can partially attribute that to more seniors taking the upper level engineering classes mentioned previously. However, even uh, when we had a class that had a broad range of class years, the seniors and juniors are still more dissatisfied than their less experienced counterparts. Um, and the survey trend still holds uh, where everyone, uh, as you can see, even first years are significantly more dissatisfied with their lab experience than their online class experience. Uh, our survey also investigated four variables to gauge students' opinion on their performance in online classes, uh, which are ability to learn material, work in a team, focus, and their motivation to complete assignments. And as you can see by the orange and red bars, uh, every variable had over a 50% negative response, uh, which shows how students really didn't like how the shift to uh, remote learning affected their performance in their classes. And if you look closely, you can see uh, in their ability to work as a team, the positive response was only 6%, which is extremely low. Uh, and we attribute that to not having the face-to-face -face communication, which can make it hard. Uh, and then ability to focus also only had 13% respond positively, uh, which you can attribute to uh, classes being on a computer, which can be very distracting and maybe not having a quiet place at home to study. And so this next graph shows the same four variables uh, on a scale of one to five, one being extremely negative and five being extremely positive with uh, a score of three being a neutral. Uh, so as you can see by learning material, uh, physics and chemistry scored above the average of the survey. Uh, however, they were still underneath the score of three for neutral, so they were a negative response. Uh, ability to work in a team, chemistry soared above the survey average, uh, and we attribute that to chemistry labs being much more dependent on teamwork, uh, making long lab reports. Um, it kind of eased them more into the transition to teamwork more. Ability to focus, again, chemistry and physics were above the survey average, uh, but physics was much further above because uh, their delivery method of online simulations uh, much more engaging than watching someone else do a procedure and using their data. So it kept them uh, watching. 
And then for motivation, again, chemistry and physics uh, above the survey average, but still below a neutral score. So as you can see, chemistry and physics uh, had average scores far above the survey average, but still as a negative response. And we think that's because the chemistry and physics classes that we looked into uh, were introductory courses. So they had an easier time transitioning than the engineering classes and the other classes that we looked at, which are higher level. So now that you've had a chance to look at some of our data, we wanted to highlight some of the biggest student takeaways on both the positive and negative side. Um, so something that, uh, that was highlighted by the students that was positive was that they had more time to develop the understanding of concepts. This was mainly seen in chemistry as they only watched about a 20 minute video and then had the rest of their class, which was about an hour and a half to complete um, their laboratories and work with their groups and solidify the understandings they're learning in their lecture. Um, they also uh, mentioned, uh, chemistry students also mentioned that their procedures were more clear as they were able to watch the instructor do it once correctly and write down what they did instead of creating their own as many people are aware of that WPI does in their chemistry courses. Um, and then also something we noticed in the physics classes with the online simulation still allowed labs to have an in-person feel, um, which was very useful for them in saying focused and on topic about what they're trying to complete in their laboratories. Some negative pieces though, were that there was no in-person help obviously, and especially with uh, labs that require software, it made them take much more time in getting everything done correctly. And it was also difficult for them to communicate with their lab groups or um, difficult to communicate with their lab groups and their instructors and figure out what needed to get done um, throughout the term. And then it was also difficult for them to stay on top of assignments as they felt that the uh, terms are very front loaded as instructors just started getting the information out to them and didn't give them a ton of time to catch up. So here we have a quote um, that we got in the uh, open-ended response section of our survey that I, we think highlights the perspective of students very well. The quote goes, I think the online labs get the job done, but they just can't compare to being able to physically interact with the materials. This was said by a biomedical engineering student who was a first year about his physics laboratory. Uh, we think this highlights very well that like, they are not getting the trial and error process that's essential for many scientists and engineers. And so next we're going to look at some of the, uh, we're going to highlight some of the instructor takeaways that we gathered through our interviews, both again on the positive and negative side. Some positive pieces as um, similar to the students, they, they enjoy the time, the extra time they had to review the concepts, while they also saw a higher quality of lab reports, which they can, they've attributed to being able to solidify those concepts that they learned in lecture. Um, and then also something else they thought was positive is that the online simulations are very safe for the students, um, as well as they didn't have to worry about uh, breaking equipment or anything like that. And then on the negative side of things, they're lacking that in-person connection that a lot of laboratory instructors enjoy and they feel that they don't get to develop the rapport with their students that they usually do. And they also feel that it was difficult to communicate their um, expectations of the students uh, while, while they're also missing the experimental process of that trial and error that WPI finds to be very efficient. So we picked out a quote from one of our uh, instructor interviews. It was Professor Kaufle in the physics department. And it goes, when the students are in my studio class after one or two weeks, I know the names of all my 72 students in the class. I know only maybe five or 10 names by today. And that was four weeks into this remote term. So that just goes to show how uh, this term, we're missing the professor and student connection, uh, which can make it harder for the professors to know when and why the students are struggling. And it, it can make it much harder for the students to ask questions to their instructors and get help. So as we begin to wrap up, some of the biggest takeaways from our project were that students are dissatisfied, but they're doing their best. A lot of them are not as happy with the online simulations and the online laboratory experience that they're having now. Um, a lot of the instructors did point out that the students are missing the experimental process. So they're missing this trial and error and the ability to struggle with the material and really cement their understanding of it. Um, professors are missing their connections with their students. As you could see from the quote um, from Professor Kafle, um, a lot of professors and student interactions typically done in labs are missing in the online environment. And then the higher level engineering classes that we looked at were struggling the most. So looking forward, if WPI were, was looking into a phased reopening of campus, our recommendation based on our research would be that higher level labor, laboratory courses could benefit the most from being a priority on campus. And as we finally wrap up, we'd like to send out some thank yous 
um, specifically to all of the instructors who worked with us to get surveys out to their students. We wouldn't have been able to do this without you. A uh, special thank you to the professors who took time out of their days to speak with us about their experiences. Uh, you really rounded our, out our view of this whole um, pandemic. And then we wanna say a special thank you to uh, Professor Hansen and Burson who really made this project possible. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Thank you to the team. <clears throat> we have a question in the chat from Professor Stafford um, asking, can you comment on the favorability of having shipped lab materials to lab materials shipped to you versus only a software simulation? Do you have anything from your surveys to judge that? Uh, so with our surveys, um, the type of lab presentation, either a, a lab procedure recorded having an online simulation uh, or having uh, physical lab materials at your house. Uh, we're unfortunately able to uh, connect those because they're so strongly correlated with the um, categories we grouped our lab into. So the chemistry students almost exclusively did uh, pre-recorded lectures. The physics students almost exclusively used online simulations and the engineering students primarily used uh, online simulations, uh, sorry, uh, pre-recorded lectures or uh, at-home lab kit kits and didn't use simulations. Uh, so we can't tell if the lab delivery method or the lab class itself uh, is the contributing factor there, unfortunately. And a lot of times um, it's just not uh, realistic for them to be able to ship materials for certain labs to students. Um, and that was something that like we noticed was not common on too much by uh, the students in the survey. The congratulations that um, you mentioned the differences between physics and chemistry and they were using different methods. Do you think that it can be said there's one method that's more effective or does it really depend on what your objectives are, whether you're trying to promote teamwork or trying to do something else specifically? I think, I think it... Uh, Go ahead, Pat. Uh, it really depends on the material uh, material of the class. Um, so as far as the physics department goes, they happen to have simulations that fit the material they were trying to teach very well, uh, as opposed to the chemistry department had trouble finding simulations like that. Um, so they ended up uh, doing pre-recorded uh, procedures, uh, which is what ended up working best for them. So it really depends more on the material than anything else. Uh, but I mean, whatever is engaging to the students would probably be the best case. Yeah, I think a mixture of what physics and chemistry did. So physics um, really succeeded with the online simulations, it seems, um, but chemistry really did well in teamwork. So I think a combination of those two different factors could really um, benefit both going forward. Thank you very much to the team for that presentation. So the next group can queue up your, uh, your presentation. <clears throat> and this is the team for coronavirus stories, capturing the voices of <coughs> college students. So you can go ahead. So hello everyone. Um, as Pierre Hansen just said, we are the coronavirus stories capturing the voices of college students. I am Galila Hailamarian. I'm Chris Ferrari. I'm Lucas Gehedo. So a little bit of background on how we ended up on this project. Our original project was slated to take place in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, with a focus on interviewing local organizations about their climate action plans. Uh, one of the main focuses of these interviews was to discuss how their climate action plans address the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, once we had those interviews compiled, we were going to be recording those, and then we were going to create a video, a video summarizing all of our findings. Um, because of coronavirus leading to a cancellation of this original project, we wanted to continue as many aspects of that original project as possible. 
leading to the project that we ended up completing this term. So as Will said, due to the coronavirus, we chose to change our project. Uh, we chose this project to collect and make available the video stories of students across the US regarding their experience with COVID-19. Once these videos were collected, we evaluated the stories gathered to find different commonalities amongst colleges' responses to this pandemic and the different student perceptions of these responses. And finally, with all of the responses collected, we worked to create a documentary compiling the best stories from the participants in order to tell a chronological story. Um, this video was also shared with universities just to make better decisions in the future if a uh, situation similar to this one was to occur. To facilitate the collection of videos from the students, uh, the team created a website with links to informative sites such as the CDC, some background information about our project, about the team members, and some tips on how to record those videos. For students to submit their stories, they went to the Submit Your Story page, which had the list of interview questions that laid the foundation for the team to gather data and for each student to tell their story. For each student, um, before they could submit their videos, they filled out a form about their demographics. Some of the data collected included the universities they attended. And as you can see on the map on the right, on the left, excuse me, uh, we received responses from 13 different universities across the US and majority of the students being from WPI. And one of the other questions we asked in that question was the year of their graduation and majority of the participants were class of 2021. Our process for analyzing the videos was rather simple. Participants uploaded their responses to our website and all the team members watched their videos. We would take notes as we were watching our videos to make sure we got the key points. Additionally, we created a transcript for record keeping. And after we took notes on those points, we created a coded set of responses that was entered into a spreadsheet, which allowed us to identify any commonalities between the responses and create data points. This was also enabled us to analyze all the videos in an efficient manner and prepare the team to analyze any amount of videos that we would receive. As a result of that data collection, we came away um, with several different commonalities identified throughout the groups. Two of the biggest ones that we are gonna to share today. Um, the first is how students' lives changed as a result of the pandemic outside of their schooling. So of the 24 respondents that we had, 11 of them said that the biggest change was due to the inability to interact with friends. Um, many of them cited that the reason for this was because college encourages students to be social, whether it's working on homework assignments together, whether it's interacting with uh, friends during classes, whether it is uh, in group projects, or if you miss class, one of your friends can take notes for you and get it to you later. Um, it, it really just encourages you to be social throughout the entire process. So to have that almost support system removed from them was a very big impact on how well and how effectively they could perform their work. The other largest response in this category, um, again at 11 of the responses said, was that the students need to find more effective ways to manage time. Many cited that the structure of university is actually what forced them to manage their time ordinarily. So when that structure was removed, what they ended up finding was that while they had more time to complete any one assignment, they were typically producing less results because they didn't feel like they had to work on the assignment at any one time. They could always just say, oh, I'll do that tomorrow until suddenly the assignment was due in two hours and they couldn't put a full amount of effort that they normally would have if they had been in school. And then the remainder of students said that what they ended up doing was taking up new hobbies. Um, they said they finally had the time to do things that they'd always wanted to do but said that they had never had time to, so they really dedicated themselves to making sure that they could pick up new hobbies. The other biggest commonality we identified was students' view on how the world would change as a result of the pandemic. Over 75% of students said that the, stu that the world would change as a result of the pandemic, with the vast majority of those students saying that it would increase through awareness of the dangers posed by large social gatherings. These could be things like concerts and sporting events. Um, and it really falls in line with how the individuals saw themselves changing as a result of the pandemic. Most students said that their biggest ch change would be that they, whenever they were out in public in large environments, they'd be really conscious of the hygiene of other people and the danger other people pose to them personally. And then other major um, points that people made were that they could see increased uh, stricter gu sanitation guidelines amongst companies and then possible reform to the US healthcare system. 
So from all of our uh, collected responses, we were able to identify three main ways in which universities could improve their responses to this pandemic. The first one being timely communication. Most decisions that were made um, by different universities were made at a time where it was near last minute and it left students scrambling to figure out their plans, kind of just for the remainder of the school year. Um, the second one we came up with was to display more empty towards students. Um, most students that we spoke with uh, felt that administration offered little empty towards their decision to completely change how the rest of the school year would play out. And that was just one of the things that a lot of students were very upset by. And then the final one was to include students more in the discussion. Uh, many students felt that they had no part in the decision that was made. And this one here is pretty much the main reason why we chose to do this project was to just give students a voice and allow them to have a platform for them to have their voice heard on. Additionally, we created a documentary to report on our findings. We divided the documentary into three main sections. The first one being an introduction. The introduction is mostly informative, showing a few news clips and establishing the setting of our documentary. It's good if somebody looks into it to, uh, in the future, they will know exactly what happened and it will prove us a nice beginning for our documentary. The second section is the main body. It provides the stories of students and it shows how they progress from the first time when they heard about the virus to their current situation as of the time of their recording. Lastly, we finish with our conclusion asking students to give advice to others. This gives a more optimistic ending to our documentary and proves as a nice finishing touch. Our goal is to make sure the students' voices are heard. So our video proves to be a nice way of doing this because you can actually see the students and see their recorded videos. And it proves to be a really personal way of doing it. Our documentary in total was about 50 minutes, but we shortened it down to a very short clip to be able to show in the presentation, and we're going to present that now. You can find our full documentary either in the YouTube channel or the team website if you want to watch it later. Hey guys, my name's Kyle. Uh, my name is Jordan Julio. My name is Paige Carter. Hi, my name is Pamela Luvali. Hi, I'm Dylan Pello. Hi, my name's Devin Allen, and I'm gonna be talking about COVID-19 and how it has affected my life. It was just a little bit in the news, all of a sudden you'd hear, the, oh, it spread to Italy. You're like, oh, it's kind of concerning. It doesn't look good there, but Nobody really took it seriously, and so I didn't think to actually do my research. Um, I, at the same time, though, I didn't really take the situation too seriously because you always hear about things like that on the news. So I remember I was in my sport finance class, and our professor was explaining to us that the entire school was starting to practice online teaching. At the time, not many people really understood what was going on. He basically said that the Pac-12 had canceled all championship events, Therefore, it was extremely likely that our seasons were over for spring sport athletes. It was crazy. It was a really big shock for me and my teammates and my family. Um, I remember I was, when I first read about it, I was, I was pissed off initially. I was upset. I was angry. I was frustrated. I was just all these different emotions. Um, emotions that I don't really, you don't really get to feel too much. We put in lots of work as athletes every single day. Having this opportunity taken away from us, uh, you know, is extremely frustrating and devastating. Um, advice I would give to anyone in a similar situation would to be get a new hobby. I bought a new skateboard, which I'm having a lot of fun with. I'm learning new tricks and learning how to do new things. I definitely think this has given me a new perspective on how important the people are in my everyday life, even just my class friends and meeting up and studying together. You know, you have you have people around you that are going through the same thing that you're going through, um, and being able to talk and communicate with them about what's going on and, and work through your problems and your difficulties is the best way to, to get to the other side, I think. So that is the end of our presentation. Are there any questions?
So I see a question. What, that, could you post the link? And this was on the end of your video. Perhaps one of you can uh, paste the link into the chat um, at some point, e even after the present your your presentation is over during the break. Um, several compliments in there. You said the video is fifty five zero minutes long. Yes, mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, one of the quotes you had in the trailer at the end was the student who said, um, there are all these emotions that you had to deal with all at the same time. Was that, con was there a consistent set of emotions or do, do you think your documentary has an emotional tone overall? Um, yeah, so in terms of the responses we received, there was really two sets of emotions. Um, there was the group that we're just taking regular online classes and didn't have anything extra going on in their lives, whether that extra bit was having a sports season that was canceled, having a study abroad that was canceled, having an internship that was canceled. And the students who didn't have that uh, tended to be a lot more understanding up front. They ended up, um, they, they understood why the decisions were made. Um, they had a lot less emotional investment in anything that was going on so they could be more understanding. Um, other than that, the, group that did feel they had something extra that was taken away from them the vast majority of those students responded with um, things like anger disappointment frustration um, a lot more negative outlook on the situation um, because all of those things that they had felt were taken away from them they had put months and months into preparing for so they had that massive amount of emotional investment in the situation um, however at the end what ended up happening was that every almost every single student was able to understand the decision made once a little bit of time had passed. While the students who felt they had more taken away from them might have felt um, angrier up front, given a week and a half or two weeks, they were able to understand the situation after seeing how it grew, um, how, it ex how quickly coronavirus spread, um, and really come to terms with, while they were still disappointed with whatever happened, they were able to understand the choices that were made. So each of you contributed uh, your own video testimonial yep. to the to the project. Yep. Yes, we did. Uh, could you say something about what that experience was like? Did it help you to work through the emotions that you were going through? I I can talk a little bit about that because I did a good portion of the editing and I basically watched a lot of the videos a couple of times. It certainly helped. Uh, like the la the very last clip in the trailer said it's really helpful to know that other people are going through the same thing as you. So it, I can say it definitely helped me at least. Yeah, I agree with Lucas. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I agree with Lucas. Uh, having IQP get canceled and no longer being able to go to Denmark, while it was frustrating, like just hearing that there are other people out there that have similar stories uh, kind of just made it easier to cope with, for me personally, at least. Yeah, I would I also agree to that too. Sorry, go ahead, Will. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so I was just saying that just talking to the camera and letting it all out there kind of helped me relieve my stress or anything. And it was really helpful having to know that other people are going through the same thing too. For, for me, even beyond just hearing that other people were going through the same thing, just saying what I was feeling was really cathartic. Um, I was able to, it was like, that's not something you normally come out and say, like it, you're, you internalize that. And so, and while you might vent to it to one or two other people who are in the same situation, that just kind of builds it up to against each other. Um, so to kind of just voice it out into the universe and be like, this is what I'm feeling. It, it really helped calm me down and be like, okay, but then you go on to talk about, okay, these are the, like, you then saw the disease progress. So it's like, okay, I understand why all those decisions were made. I'm okay with all the decisions that were made. And while I felt that way, I'm more peace with what ended up happening now. We uh, what can wrap this up in one moment. I'll just, there's a, another question that came in um, about, um, did students feel they had adequate resources, um, say from WPI for their mental health and for uh, dealing with these issues we've been talking about? So I know from some of the videos, um, while we didn't ask any questions specifically relating to mental health, um, 
I know a lot of people mentioned that there was just a large amount more stress that they felt was on them. And it was, it was just because so much of the isolation aspect of it, you couldn't rely on other people to help you with stuff. Like if you had a question on homework, it's a lot harder to set up a Zoom call and try and work something through with someone who you would be, who you have the class with than it is to sit next to them in a class one day and just be like, hey, um, I was having this issue. Did you figure out how to do that? So a lot of them had a lot more stress. Um, but at the same time, they a lot of them mentioned that because they were home, they had emotional outlets they don't typically have, whether it was a pet or a family member or something that is typically farther away, but was now more centralized. So it was a give take. Um, uh, but that that's about as close as we got to the mental health aspect of it. I know there were also two students within that did submissions that one of them talked about how she just started crying one day randomly about because she just like thought about being able to give someone a hug and she got mm -hmm. like really upset about that whole thing and then there was another girl that submitted something talking about she was going through a breakup and then that on top of all the social like isolation and stuff kind of made it a lot worse for her but in the long run it helped her like intern like kind of just deal with her feelings rather than pushing it off so it was kind of like a give and take while it was like bad people were able to kind of grow within themselves kind of through this whole isolation <laughs> Well, I think these are general issues for all of us to deal with. And uh, I want to thank the team for helping raise those, um, bring those to the surface. Uh, we will take a break for a few minutes, um, but let's give our thanks to this last team for their presentation. So I will uh, share my screen with a uh, just a blank. We'll be back in a few minutes screen, and um, we will start kind of promptly at, um, at 115. Okay. The next team on the agenda is recording human stories in a time of crisis. So with that, I'll let the team introduce themselves. Hi. We're a group of five juniors at Worcester Polytechnic Institute working to record the varied experience of living through the current COVID-19 pandemic in fulfillment of our interactive qualifying project. We'll spend the next 10 minutes walking you through our holistic project process with about five minutes reserved at the end for any lingering questions you may have for us. But first, my teammates and I would like to formally introduce ourselves to you on the platform that has been so integral to our remote learning experience. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alex Clank. I'm from McLean, Virginia, and I'm studying aerospace engineering at WPI. Hi, everyone. My name is Amelia Perez, and I'm from South Jersey, and I'm studying civil engineering at WPI. My name is Henry Postkanzer. I'm from Palo Alto, California, and I'm studying computer science and math. Hi, my name is Raj Kumar Dandekar, and I'm from Hopkinton, Massachusetts, and I'm studying mechanical engineering. Hi, I'm Chioma Nyonokwe. I'm originally from Lagos, Nigeria, and I'm currently studying robotics engineering at WPI. All right, so while I'm sure everyone knows about the COVID-19 outbreak, our team has chosen to develop a timeline to better visualize the spread of the virus. The timeline allowed us to more efficiently um, present and contextualize the data about the disease and the social response to it. So as you can see from its discovery in humans on December 31st in uh, 2019, it took only 20 days for the virus to spread outside of China into the US. On March 6th of 2020, the confirmed case count passed 100,000 globally. As you can see here, the case count hit 1 million cases worldwide on April 2nd of 2020, and then rose in just 13 days to 2 million, is currently at 4.2 million confirmed cases worldwide. 
Due to the uncertain nature of the pandemic, our team recognized that some participants may be in difficult situations and we did not want to act as a burden or alter their response in any way. Our team conducted research on ethics and strategies of interviewing, and we have come away with three main lessons. The first is to historically contextualize the experience of your sources, which allows viewers to better understand the storyteller situation. The second is to center your archive around the unique perspectives of its con contributors. And the third is to allow interviewees to control their own narrative. Both of these lessons help to ensure that the story will not be inter interpreted incorrectly and that it is captured in a good and just light. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about our methodology. While we worked on this project, we came to realize that there were blurry lines between our three objectives. So we reused a lot of methods for multiple objectives. We used samples of convenience, reaching out to our peers and family to understand their perspectives. From there, we conducted snowball sampling to find more subjects. Semi-structured interviews helped us elicit stories relating to the pandemic. For participants who did not want to be interviewed, we would send them our interview questions and they would respond with their answers in a written audio or video recording. For some participants, we conducted two interviews spaced two to three weeks apart. We then compared their answers to see how their perspectives have changed over time. In addition, photographs and videos were essential to illustrating how the pandemic has changed our communities and environment. We obtained these recordings using our samples of convenience and snowball sampling. We also made some of these recordings ourselves. After we collected our data, we used a spreadsheet to analyze it. We wrote down the ideas that appeared in each interview. Some ideas came up uh, in multiple interviews, so we made this color code for them. We allocated one row for each interview and wrote one idea in each cell. We colored the cells according to our key. If an idea was not repeated in any other interview, we left that cell uncolored. Then we zoomed out to see which colors appeared frequently in the spreadsheet. We identified the corresponding ideas as the main trends in our data. To help present our data from various states and countries, we, utilize, we decided to utilize an interactive map to display our interviews and stories. So on this map, we used markers to indicate the locations of stories, interviews, and indicators of community and environmental changes. You will see we are able to collect data from 10 countries spread over five continents. Each of these markers on the map is clickable and will bring up a story, interview, or indicator of change, depending on the marker. Each marker will feature a slightly different layout. For example, this marker includes an image which links to a video of the interview while also containing a transcription of the interview. Many of our subjects ask for some degree of anonymity, which we accommodated by removing their names, names of their workplaces, or by taking whatever other methods they wished. In total, we collected 43 unique data entries, of which we would now like to highlight a few. So we, here we have an anonymous single interview from a subject living in Houston, Texas. He and his wife work for a NASA contractor and have had to work fully from home. They also have had to adopt unusual schedules involving waking up early to start work, taking care of their three and six year old kids and providing their education during the day and then finishing up work at night. The subject noted that this has negatively impacted his productivity at times and he spent a large amount of time discussing how difficult this time could be for people, even if they aren't directly affected by the virus. This is an example of one of the indicators of community and environmental change images we took and received from outside sources. This image shows a family celebrating a birthday party outside. One member of the family who came from a different household is sitting separately to the rest to prevent possible transmission of the coronavirus. 
we archived numerous images like this one showing how people and their environment have adapted and changed due to the conditions produced by the pandemic. As my teammate Alex here has clearly demonstrated, we were, not with, we were met with a relatively diverse sample set by the end of our data collection process. Of the 53 entries mapped to our archive, 40 were story or interview responses requiring precise qualitative analysis. How then were we able to make broad claims about the experience of living through this pandemic? Well, the matrix that Henry described earlier came in especially handy during this process. And it led to some of our most striking observations being summarized by frequency of occurrence in the figure before you. As you can see, several of the themes as shown in rows one, three, and five to be exact, expressed by our respondents, reflect that people across age, occupation, and location were adapting to a new way of life, a new normal, as some of them put it. Additionally, the frequency with which themes two and four came up implied a newfound sense of civic responsibility a concept somewhat unusual to our sources, most of whom grew up, grew up on the teachings of US individualism. Some people felt strict obligations to obey the social distancing measures put in place to ensure the confirmed continued safety of those around them. Others believed that the government had a responsibility to protect its constituents from harm, particularly its most vulnerable populations while others took up the responsibility of amplifying related social causes like health care reform and reproductive justice. All in all, respondents were quick to recognize privileged disparities in people's COVID-19 exp experiences. To supplement these findings, we've decided to further contextualize the changing landscape in which the pandemic was um, situated using media collected in fulfillment of our third objective. We received several submissions from eager participants willing to showcase their communal observations. Here is a single image from the New York Times that stood out to us as an apt reflection of this crisis visual landscape. Such a photo of a field of excess, of excess onions waiting to be destroyed exists in stark contrast to the lived realities of some of our respondents where shopping, shopping experiences became incredibly limited during this time. Lindsay Zabelski, a South New Jersey educator and mother of five, describes just how traumatizing grocery shopping has been for her. Some of our, of our team were, evil, were even able to photograph their own experiences during this period, perfectly encapsulating the absurdity of the situation the world now finds itself in. The shortcomings of the U.S. food supply chain laid bare in this photo series are but one of many such inequities that, the, that came to light globally in the throes of this pandemic. This did not go unnoticed by many of our respondents who consistently expressed regret that no one, neither government nor individual, was properly prepared for the COVID-19 pandemic. Over time, however, respondents grew more and more accustomed to life under lockdown, making more hopeful predictions for the future. This burgeoning hope for something better, as echoed by the Nigerian student living in Lagos, led our team to develop the following recommendations. Yeah, so after we gathered and analyzed our data, we were able to develop three really distinct recommendations for future researchers and the elected officials that are often on the front lines of managing crises like this. Our first recommendation is for social science researchers to continue to collect stories. Stories remain one of the most powerful ways to share experiences. They are also a powerful learning tool. Even today during this pandemic, we reflect on the experiences of those who lived through the Spanish flu outbreak in 1918 to inform policy decisions made today. Continuing this work to learn not just the science, but the humanity behind tragedy can do much to prevent human suffering in the future. Our second recommendation is for these stories that are collected to be archived to ensure that when they do need to be referenced, the information is readily available. 
We recommend that universities play a role in hosting this data. Having it easily accessible would greatly benefit the transfer of knowledge as we share and learn from global experiences. And our final recommendation was developed based on a trend found in our responses. Many of those who shared their experiences reported they felt as though there was a lack of clarity in regard to the current regulations. Some expressed that they themselves weren't even sure if they could go for a drive or for a walk, but it seemed like it was allowed. Others expressed frustration that many people seem to not understand or completely disregard regulations surrounding social distancing and continue to not wear masks or gather in large groups. Due to this, we recommend increased accessibility to information regarding public health recommendations, especially in rapidly evolving developing situations such as this. Increased accessibility can include radio and TV statements, as well as physical signs in public spaces sharing, sharing the public health recommendations. We recognize that not everyone has the same access to technology and therefore the most up-to-date policies and recommendations and urge authorities to keep this in mind when developing ways to educate communities in times of crisis. And finally, we would like to thank all of you for taking the time to listen to us. We'd like to thank our professors, Professor Kumar, Professor Shaki, for really guiding us through uncharted territory. And we'd like to thank every person who took the time to share with us during what has been a difficult time for a lot of people. We really did ask a lot for people to reflect on a situation that was continuing to unfold. And we are grateful for their partition, participation in our project. Um, and we now we have some time for questions. Thank you, team. There's a question that's come in. Um, did you look at issues regarding misinformation spread by social media? Was there any discussion in some of your stories about that? Um, we didn't look specifically at that. We kind of just, you know, looked at trends that people spoke about, but there was a lot of people who spoke about, like they didn't even know if they could like walk through their neighborhood or, they saw some people at the beach and then some people even expressed like anger when they heard about like some states reopening, you know, people allowed to go to the beach and that kind of thing. Um, but no one explicitly like talked about like they're, you know, hearing something from one person and then a different thing from another person. So there's a note from Professor Shockey that to for you to acknowledge the role of the global lab with your stories and uh, I'll note that and um, say thank you very much to the team. So we can uh, go on to the next uh, set of presentations. Thank you very much. So for our next um, set of presentation, coronavirus global stories, also advised by Professor Shaki and Kumar, but the team can uh, queue up your presentation and introduce yourselves. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are a group of WPI students working to fulfill our inter uh, our IQP. Um, our project is Corona Global Coronavirus Stories. That's me on the left. I'm Scott D'Atilio. I'm from Boxford, Massachusetts, and I'm an aerospace student here at WPI. Uh, next to Scott, I am Jeremy Gagnon. I am from Tacoma Park, Maryland, and I'm also an aerospace engineering student. Jesse Lee, I'm from China. Um, I major in mechanical engineering. And I'm Andrew Ressler. I'm located in North Reading, Massachusetts, and I am a bioinformatics and computer science major. So the goal of our project was to document the stories and perspectives of young adults during the coronavirus pandemic of 2020. We devised these three objectives to meet that end successfully. We decided to hone in on college age student or individuals, not just students, uh, because their voices can often be overlooked or misrepresented within mass media in the government. We also felt that this demographic could give us a, a wide variety of 
perspectives and uh, possibly themes to draw from. Uh, we gathered the stories through interviews over Zoom and surveys using uh, samples of convenience. Uh, and to find these uh, shared themes and rhetoric, we gathered data from the same source, the same person, multiple times over the course of several weeks. Uh, this allowed us to compare these perspectives against each other from which we could find meaningful patterns in the rhetoric and their stories. Uh, and then finally, to display these stories, we collaborated with the Global Lab here at WPI to contribute to the COVID-19 platform webpage that consists of multiple COVID stories teams findings. Uh, and now I'll hand it over to Chessie so we can take a look at some of our findings. So in the service, we send out to our interviews every week. There are basically three quantitative questions which we ask our interviewees opinions on how they feel physically, mentally, and how socially serious they think um, coronavirus is. Here is the line graph, uh, which consists of all the quantitative data we have collected uh, in the span of four weeks. In the scale we gave, to our interviewees, it spans from zero to 100, where 100 means feeling the best, either physically or mentally, or it means they believe coronavirus is extremely serious in a societal perspective. The lower score could mean um, they feel slightly worse or they think COVID-19 is less serious. Um, from these data we collected, the average seriousness score in yellow has been gradually lower, interestingly enough, and um, the average of feeling scores in green and red fluctuate each week, but mostly stays in the range between high 60 and low 70. And uh, now let's uh, take a look at the student perspectives. Right, so obviously an over overwhelming majority of our um, participants were students. Um, and so through our interviews and some of our surveys, we noticed some overarching themes um, between a lot of our student participants. Um, so these include obviously feeling um, restlessness and feelings of isolation. Obviously people are um, kept inside during these times. Um, a lot of students reported that they were feeling uncomfortable because they had suddenly been trapped back at home um, and a lot of students' families were adjusting to this, um, having more people back in their houses suddenly. Um, obviously, a lot of students reported missing friends and being out in public. Um, and more seriously, there was a lot of worries regarding uh, career pathways, right? So students discussed um, missing out on internships and a lot more uncertainty, especially amongst seniors for what they were gonna be doing after graduation just due to uh, the economic implications of this crisis. Um, furthermore, there is a lot of uh, discussion of discomfort with the online courses that a lot of these students were enrolled in, although those tended to um, become less and less serious over time as people got more used to using stuff like Zoom. Um, so now we're gonna talk about our essential workers that we interviewed, a slightly smaller group um, and there was some overlap here. So there were some students that we interviewed that were also still working as essential workers. Um, but overall, through, through this group of young essential workers, we noticed that there was um, very little concern for their own personal safety um, and much more concern for, you know, people that they would be interacting with, um, especially loved ones who would be vulnerable and could contract the virus from them. Um, many were still happy just to be working, uh, and a lot had, you know, friends or family who had, you know, been struggling financially during this time um, due to loss of jobs. Um, but overall, a lot of people were not entirely concerned for their own health, um, but were concerned about others. Uh, so we have a, a quote from a DC firefighter here that was one of our interviewees um, that reads, I don't really think much about it, uh, I don't really think it about it that much. Even if we follow the protocols, we're still almost just as exposed as everyone else. Um, so this is really just a, a common sentiment we found amongst a lot of our young essential workers. 
Now we're gonna to go to Andrew for some of our recommendations. Yes, so consistent with the findings in our project, we have a few recommendations, both general and specific. On the first, which is rather general, is to can continue checking in on this generation of young adults. Um, while they may not have faced as many direct consequences from the virus as older generations, they were still adversely impacted in several different ways, from those graduating college, not having proper commencement ceremonies, to difficulty finding their first job, to perhaps starting a new job in an online context where networking and building connections with coworkers is much more difficult. Um, and of course, for those our young adults who were already working, many of them have either lost their jobs or are in a very tricky essential worker situation where they have to take their own safety or others safety into consideration. So at that we recommend that this is kept in mind when it comes to this generation going forward. Uh, one specific thing we might recommend there is that any future stimulus plans take into account that young people have often been just as impacted by this. For example, the first stimulus plan um, put up by the federal government did not include any stimulus checks um, for dependents who are over the age of 16. So that's something that could be potentially amended in future plans if any are necessary. Our next recommendation has to do with the archiving of pandemic stories, uh, which we believe is very important not only for historical continuity and reference, but also because what is going on now should and will inform the decision making of future policymakers. Um, future doctors, healthcare providers, and whatnot, should a situation like this ever occur again. So, of course, we recommend that the National Archives and the Library of Congress and other large organizations work to archive pandemic stories. And we also have, which we'll get to in a second, a few specific recommendations for the WPI Global Labs initiative to do so. Um, we recommend that an attempt is made to maintain historical objectivity as much as possible in these archival um, efforts. And in our own project, we believe we have done that by focusing very heavily on the um, direct quotes from the words of those we have interviewed. We're quoting those interviews and using their quotes and not just interpreting them, but really letting them speak for themselves. And then as for the WPI Global Lab, uh, we commend them for creating a great platform so far for all these stories to be shared. I highly recommend everybody visit that website. Uh, they have set up, um, you can see lots of our information up there. And we recommend that not only does this website continue to be hosted, but that it's added to and curated over time so that it can really work as a resource for learning about this time in the near and far future. So with one of the big focuses of our project being obtaining an international perspective on this pandemic and how it has affected young adults beyond just the state of Massachusetts, we conducted interviews with young adults across many different countries, 12 or 13. Uh, you can see the various non-US countries we interviewed people from here. And so what we'd like to do is have audience members put in the chat real quickly, a few countries they'd like to hear about things and we'll just pick the first two or whoever comments two countries first, and we'll talk about our experience with a story from our country. We'll just pick whichever two we see in the chat. So I see Russia. Russia. Interesting pick. Let's, uh... so um, our interviewer who lives in Moscow, Russia, indicated that people there weren't taking coronavirus very seriously and still practicing their daily routines without any protections in the beginning. Uh, with the number of diagnosed cases drastically increased, some people started to be more aware of it and limit themselves from going outside. Uh, our, our interviewer, uh, our interviewee told us a very interesting story that uh, since people don't want to go outside but still want to protest for various reasons, they would gather online on Google map and express their opinions on, in the comment bubbles, as we can see from the slide. Um, so there was a period of time where people could see a crowd of comment bubbles in some, uh, in some parks on Google map. That was uh, where there were planned to protest where it was uh, used to be the venue. 
Um, All right. And I see that the second country posted was India. So I'll talk about that briefly. I interviewed a young adult from India who is actually a WPI student. During the spring break, he made the decision to return to India and voluntarily quarantined himself for 14 days in his family's apartment. Uh, by the time this 14 days was coming to an end, the whole country of India had actually gone on a lockdown. So he had to continue that. Um, India went on a bit of a stricter lockdown than the United States in that not only did they close non-essential businesses, but they're very careful with uh, how they allowed access to their essential businesses. For example, uh, you could only go out to grocery stores on certain times or certain days, and they're very limited in the number of people that could enter at once. Uh, this student's perspective on this, as he's been taking online WPI classes like the rest of us, was that... Uh, his biggest challenge with these online courses is that he's nine and a half hours away, which means he's often staying up extremely late or getting up extremely early in order to complete his schoolwork. So that has been a challenge for him. And now we'd like to do the so same thing with different US states. So you see here in green are states where we interviewed young adults from. So people could post in the chat and we'll take the first two. Looks like we have Maine and Colorado. So I'll talk about Maine because I interviewed someone from there. Uh, Maine was very interesting to get a perspective on because the person I interviewed was located in Freeport, just north of Portland, Maine. And based on what they told me, all of Southern Maine, Portland, and beneath that has very much had a similar re reaction to Massachusetts and New York with taking this pandemic extremely seriously, um, social distancing, isolating in their homes and whatnot. But as you get farther north in Maine and the population gets less dense, people have been taking it less and less seriously. There have also been less and less cases, most likely because it is less dense. So my interviewee described to me a story of a Maine restaurant owner near his location who had decided he was just going to reopen his restaurant um, due to his county only having a few cases. And so he set a date for that and when he reopened the restaurant, there were actually about 100 or 200 patrons, far more than normal, which showed up just because many different people were really hoping to get out to a restaurant. And then the restaurant owner was actually arrested about two hours after opening for violating the uh, closure of restaurants order from the main governor. All right, and uh, I did Colorado. Um, I think there's a, a link if you wanna click on that. Um, so I interviewed a member of the Colorado National Guard. Um, so our first interview was right before he was deployed to Denver. Um, and since then, he has been helping out with the homeless population up there. Um, so a lot of what they're doing is, you know, as you can see, organizing um, food kitchens and setting up um, temporary housing for the homeless population, as well as administering testing. Um, and so in Colorado, like a lot of states in that part of the country, they were sort of slow to adopt a lot of these um, quarantine rules um, and they were pretty late to close everything down. Um, but he says that at this point, it's pretty much as um, strict as most places in the country, although there are a lot of people out there that, that are wanting to open the country back up. But um, he's still in Denver and they're there um, for an unknown amount of time, um, just based on how the virus is doing in terms of case numbers there. So uh, I think that is it. Um, we'd like to thank you for watching and we'd like to extend a special thanks to our professors, Professor Shockey and Professor Kumar for just helping us through these difficult times and um, you know, easing the transition into this very new project. So thank you. Thank you to the team. I see in the chat that uh, Professor Dodson is uh, giving a, a good wishes from the Global Lab and is pleased to work with you. So I think we uh, will move to the next team and we can take some more questions or discussions at the end of the, at, um, of the other presentations for this team. So the next team up is evaluating impacts of the COVID-19 on the dairy industry. Oh, 
Good afternoon, everyone. We are a group of undergraduate students at WPI studying the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the dairy industry. I'm Connor Mulvey. My name is Ryan Peters. And I am Nathaniel Rakowski. So during our research, we learned that there has been a trend of consolidation of small multi-generational family farms, as shown in these pictures, into large industrial scale farms over the past several years in the dairy industry. This has been primarily due to dairy farmers struggling with low milk prices that have been changing a lot over the past five years or so. These issues have been exasperated by the coronavirus pandemic, which has dropped milk prices even further down to a 20 year low and will force more farms to close. More recently, milk dumping has been common in national headlines in March and April, but the actual impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the entire dairy industry has not been thoroughly investigated. So this is an overview of how the dairy supply chain works. So we start, of course, on the left at the farm where cows are milked. Um, from there, the milk is picked up by dairy cooperatives. These cooperatives are owned by the farmers and they function to pool this milk together and market it to processors. So different processors are gonna take this milk and turn it into a variety of products. Some processing facilities are more oriented towards retail markets like grocery stores, while others make bulk products for, for um, food service markets like restaurants and schools. So this whole system is highly regulated by the government and various contracts between these different groups. The alternative that many small farms have turned to is processing the milk themselves and running a farm stand. Now, what has happened during the pandemic is that schools and restaurants have closed along with all non-essential businesses. So this has virtually eliminated the food service market. With that market gone, demand has increased at both retail and farm stands. However, processing plants can't quickly change uh, to making these retail products and farms can't quickly build new processing facilities. So many processing facilities are closing down. With this bottleneck in processing, many dairy cooperatives and farmers have been unable to sell a lot of their milk, leaving no choice but to dump it. Our approach to evaluating the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic was to talk to a variety of different stakeholders throughout the supply chain. This includes the dairy farmers, which supply milk to the cooperatives, which have the milk processed at creameries, that supply the milk to vendors, which then sell them to consumers. These interviews have helped us gain a complete understanding of the industry. So we initially looked at reports from the United States Department of Agriculture and found dairy production, for example, cheese products, was strong during the months of March and April with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic but demand has shifted with the closures of restaurants and schools, which actually led to um, milk prices dropping. We then interviewed with dairy farmers and found that the ones with more diversified businesses were suffering less during the pandemic. Those that had their own farm stands to sell their own products at saw a significant growth in sales at their farm stands. Many of the farmers we talked to were also uncertain of their futures because of the financial losses. One farmer told us in an interview, if something does not happen to help them, they'll be done. And this fact was not helped because many farmers we interviewed told us they had not yet received financial support from the government. Next, we talked to dairy cooperatives and processors, otherwise known as creameries. Um, as I mentioned before, those serving retail markets have seen an increase in demand, and accordingly, they've ramped up production. For example, one large creamery that we talked to said that they're operating seven days a week, 20 hours a day, with only four hours for cleaning. So through these extended hours, some of these creameries have been able to process more milk, which um, with one who reported that they have extended their network of producers to source more raw milk. So this has helped some uh, cooperatives who were struggling, um, but it's not enough to help everybody. One cooperative we talked to is still unfortunately dumping milk, said that processors are maxing out lines that are desired, but it's not enough to process all the milk. Now, cooperatives and creameries who are serving food service markets have been devastated. Many processing plants for bulk products have completely shut down or reduced operations dramatically, such as one who said they are operating 
three shifts seven days a week before the pandemic, but now they're only doing one shift once a week. This is a plant that makes small half pints uh, for schools, but that's not in demand anymore. They're trying to retrofit these facilities to produce retail products, but they didn't report much progress because it typically takes months to make these equipment changes and requires significant capital. This has been detrimental to cooperatives who normally supply these processors. One cooperative who's dumping two thirds of their milk lamented that if we can't find businesses soon, 27 farms will be out of business and that's all of their members. We also talked to some vendors consumers. These interviews have highlighted the volatility in the market demand for dairy products in mid to late March when school closures and the government stay at home orders first went into place. During this time, some of, the some of the consumers we talked to had concerns about the availability of dairy products in larger stores. Many consumers have ventured out to farm stands, more often caused by a distrust over the environment in the larger stores, a trend which we have also seen for dairy farmers running farm stands. Changes in consumer habits during the pandemic will have long lasting effects on consumer shopping in the future. So throughout our project, we kept two of the United Nations sustainable development goals in mind throughout this project. Goal nine, which is to build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. And goal 12, which is to ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. We found that the U.S. dairy industry has yet to develop resilient infrastructure as limitations in processing facilities severely disrupted the supply chain. The U.S. dairy industry is also tending to become a less inclusive business as there has been a trend of smaller farms going out of business and consolidating into larger farms. And this is likely to be accelerated due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the financial losses that farmers are going to incur. During times of crises, there is a lack of responsible consumption, which was witnessed during the month of March and April as consumers were panic buying dairy products and causing shortages in grocery stores. Additionally, the current state of the dairy industry is unsustainable for many dairy farmers as the current prices of milk are not able to provide farmers with enough income to offset the cost of operating their farms. Uh, continuing reckless consolidation of dairy farms is also irresponsible to the sustainable production of dairy and maintaining biodiversity within the dairy industry. Our first recommendation is towards cooperatives, some of whom have imposed stringent policies on dairy farmers. We propose allowing more farmers to dump their own milk instead of having the milk being dumped later on the supply chain to save farmers some of the handling costs. We also propose that governments better fund and make more available for dairy farmers programs like PUP, CFAP, and WIP Plus as they are currently being underserved as an important part of national food security. We would also like to see long-term changes in the regulation around milk production and prices as the current system is confusing even to farmers. We also recommend that many of the smaller farms market more directly to consumers as the farmers we talked to that were doing well had more direct connections through their farm stands. Another recommendation we have would also be for processors to have more flexible supply chains so they can more easily switch between the bulk food service products and the retail products for dairy. Finally, we would also like to see an improvement in trade relations between other countries as tariffs in the past have caused the dairy industry to suffer these past few years. So apart from our IQP report that we have finished, we are planning on sh further sharing these stories by writing letter letters to senators and representatives for the states that we interviewed farmers in to sort of share their stories and encourage and urge legis legislative action be taken to help them. We're also planning on publishing in both magazine and journal articles just to share these stories to a wider audience. Thank you very much for your time. We'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much to the team. I, we have a question in the, uh, in the chat. Did you talk to any producers of organic dairy products or just that angle, you know, how would you illuminate your study with that? Um, yeah, so um, some of the farmers we talked to, they did produce a variety of products. Some of them were organic dairy. Um, some of them produced organic milk and that kind of thing. But um, 
Yeah. You highlighted the, as we see if there's any other questions that come in, the difference between the consumer, to, you know, market for the milk and the, the, the other less direct consumer things. And your recommendations to the end um, is, we're, we're very interesting. And I like the idea that you want to take action with some of your recommendations writing uh, for the broader public. That's very impressive. Do you have any you know, sense now where you will take some of those recommendations to the public of what specific states, steps you think a consumer could take that could help this industry? Um, sure, yeah. So I think that it's very important that consumers um, think about where their food and milk is coming from, all these dairy products. Um, if you think about the farms, that um, is really going to help. And, and look around. There's probably um, farm stands near you um, that you can purchase from. And so um, that would definitely help. We also recommend that um, farms uh, put on more outreach events, like uh, farm to table events and cooking classes, maybe, um, to really engage the community. Um, and I think that um, people just need to reconnect where their food comes from, um, it, you know, in, in thinking about where they purchase products. It's another question that has come in on the chat about where the farmers were before the pandemic, which I might, you know, amplify. Is this a crisis that is the consequence of the pandemic or is it something really that was more structural that was and the I, pandemic is the thing that's launched it into a, <laughs> an obvious crisis that we can now all see. That's a very complicated question. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's definitely a little bit of both. We talked to, um, we got a variety of responses. We did ask all of the people we interviewed how they've been doing for the last five years. Um, and some of them have been doing all right. Um, and But many of them have been struggling. Um, the past five years um, have seen lower milk prices. Um, than there were even 10 years ago in some cases. So um, a lot of smaller farms are not able to operate with the lower prices, um, which is part of what's driving this consolidation into bigger and bigger farms because you can um, operate on tighter margins at, at scale. Um, so in some ways, uh, it's been a long time coming. Um, people have been struggling for the last five years, but um, in other ways, um, even, if it came, even if the pandemic came at a good time, it still would have caused a lot of havoc um, uh, on the supply chain. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we started a, a minute, few minutes late. So if you, you have any... Um... I mean, I could keep talking about that. <laughs> no, I'm sure you, uh, we, we all could. Um, it was um, a, uh, a, a very nice study. I, um, Thank you. It was found that the, um, um, the structural analysis was nicely combined with your kind of, um, you know, community oriented, uh, the yeah. data you generated through interviews and, and contact with people. So it's very nice. Thank you. Yeah, and, and we definitely offer recommendations on, on both fronts. Um, we, we certainly think that the regulations around the market need to be evaluated. Um, it's really complicated how um, the government regulates everything. And um, even the farmers don't understand all of how these regulations work. And so um, we definitely recommend uh, looking into the, the whole structure as well as um, smaller things people consider uh, where their food's coming from. Good. Well, we have the next presentation to go to, and if we'll, we might have a chance to take some other questions as we get uh, after yeah. we've gone through. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much to this team. And now we await this, the presentation from the many faces of COVID. That team can take the stage and begin sharing your screen. All right. Can everybody see the screen? I'm going to take yes. that as a this is, yes. You're good, so. Yay. <laughs> well, welcome. 
My name is David Roby. I am an aerospace engineering DSMS student here at WPI. Name is Matthew Galvin. I'm a computer science major here at WPI. And I'm Gwyneth Zalmanow. I am currently a double major studying electrical and computer engineering and physics at WPI. And we are the Many Faces of COVID project team. So as we all know, we are currently living through the COVID-19 crisis. This virus spreads at an alarming rate, quickly reaching populated areas all over the world. This graph is showing the number of confirmed cases by day in various places throughout the world. Be aware, these numbers most likely are higher than reported due to limited testing. In the United States, the epicenter of COVID-19 is in New York, which as of May 8th has about 340,000 confirmed cases. COVID-19 is highly contagious, which has caused stay-at-home orders to be placed to encourage people to social distance. Social distancing means staying at home and working remotely as much as possible, keeping your distance, avoiding crowds and physical touch, and to wash your hands regularly. Social distancing has affected people across the country. In fact, 20.5 million Americans filed for unemployment in April, with the unemployment rate reaching 14.7%, which hasn't been this high since the Great Depression. Some people are starting to feel boxed in. Their anxiety and depression levels are rising as they try to do work and or school remotely. Instead of celebrating birthdays, anniversaries, graduations, births, and other important events in person, we now have to do it all virtually. People aren't allowed to physically be with loved ones who don't live with them. They can't give each other hugs, kisses, or even high fives. We all have lost basic human contact. Our team realized that we were in uncharted territory and that we had the unique opportunity of studying how people were being psychologically affected by COVID-19. Once realizing this opportunity, our team had the goal of capturing the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of adults across the United States during the COVID-19 pandemic through the use of a longitudinal daily diary. In order to distribute our survey, we had a website dedicated to sharing our content. When coming to the website, study participants were first greeted with this homepage featuring information about our study and a button to enter the longitudinal daily diary. After clicking the button, the daily logging would begin. Participants clicked and dragged sliders for various prompts, such as the news about COVID worries me and I am feeling anxious. These sliders range from not like me at all to extremely like me in order to record their psychological and emotional state of mind for the day. The numerical data we gathered formed the outline of each participant, like an emotional silhouette in a picture. Imagine a blank wall. On it, a few picture frames appear. You're struggling to see the silhouettes of people, and as you strain your eyes, a few more appear, and then a few more. You're drawn to attempting to see many more details, a sense of curiosity which makes us uniquely human. As a team, this is the exact feeling we shared when conducting our study. We had the data and we had the numbers, and yet we yearned to see the people behind it all. We wanted to see their unique story and figure out why their data and numbers looked the way that they did. What if I told you we had a flashlight and we're able to shine a light on these pictures on the wall? Would you be able to see the pictures more clearly now? Just like a flashlight adds definition to a darkened picture, we developed a tool which brings a personality to light in faceless data. Let's take a closer look at this tool. Two key characteristics were found in all participant data, variance and severity. 
Variance defines how a person changes on a day-to-day -day basis. Ever felt sad one day and really happy on the next? But exactly how sad and how happy did you feel? That's where severity comes in. We took six emotions and feelings, which each of our participants reported to us and calculated profiles for them based on their results. Using these profiles for each of the six emotions and feelings, we created visualizations such as these, which convey variance and severity. On the visualization, variance is represented by proximity to the center with bubbles closer to the edge representing high variance and bubbles closer to the center representing steadiness throughout the study. Severity is represented by bubble size with a larger bubble representing a more severe feeling. This visualization tool, a polar bubble graph, is our flashlight which eliminates the shadows cast on people and illuminates their stories. To finally bring the three-dimensional person out of the two-dimensional photograph, we asked participants to tell us stories about personal experiences and the ways that they coped with COVID. We also asked these participants how helpful they thought these coping mechanisms were and the extent they found themselves trying new activities. Each respondent had a slightly different way of dealing with their stress, some positive, such as exercise, and some negative, such as substance abuse. One such respondent said that they had begun stress eating due to the quarantine. We were curious to see if evidence of this coping mechanism could be found in this participant's longitudinal survey data. In the polar bubble graph that we generated for this respondent, we saw that their anxiety and sadness were, highly, were severely high for the duration of the study. This data could explain how the participant's negative coping mechanism during this period of quarantine had a large impact on their emotional health. This relationship between this person's story and polar bubble graph is further strengthened as their energy level remained stead steadily low during the study, a known side effect of stress eating. This could be a good example of emotional representation based on a negative behavior. The vast majority of answers indicated that our participants are coping with these difficult times by engaging in things that they normally do and by trying new activities. Our next person commented that they have responded to the pandemic by engaging activities such as taking walks in the woods, practicing yoga, and cleaning their house. These new activities help this person as doing these things gives them a feeling of control since what's going on around us is so far out of our control. As a result, this person's polar bubble graph shows that their energy level was con uh, constantly in the mid range and their feeling of safety was in the high range. While their anxiety, fear, and sadness fluctuated on a day-to-day -day basis, they still reported that all three remained in the low range. This relationship between this person's story and their polar bubble graph is further strengthened as their wellness was reported to be constantly high and their safety fluctuated heavily. For someone enjoying the outdoors, it is a risk to go outside and potentially meet another person. That could be a direct reasoning for their reported emotions. Some people have undergone a massive shift in lifestyle due to the travel restrictions and quarantining during the present pandemic. For example, person three normally travels all over the United States with their significant other. However, due to COVID-19, they have been forced to stay in one state, interrupting their travel plans for the foreseeable future. They say that we still have, we still have some ups and downs, parts of days, never whole ones, where we are very sad or just demoralized. In addition, this person's polar bubble graph shows a high steady level of sadness throughout the duration of the study. Thankfully, they are able to get through these days by supporting each other and taking comfort in the knowledge that this interruption of their lifestyle will pass. This relationship between this person's story and the polar bubble graph is further strengthened as their wellness was also reported as high as sadness, showing that while they recognize the negative emotions they face, they make an effort to focus on positive emotions too. The final person we will discuss is finding solace through the knowledge that this pandemic will eventually pass and remembering her experience during the Vietnam War. Her husband was drafted shortly after they were married and she was stressed and scared that he might not return. She said, it was much scarier then, but I thought about all of the women in World War II who didn't know when or if their men were coming back but mine would be gone for a year, not many years. I use the strategies I use then, now. I try to find positives in any stressful situation and use humor to help me cope. Her polar bubble graph 
shows that her emotions were extremely variable and often her anxiety was high and her feeling of safety low, but her wellness was consistently high. Possibly she used this coping mechanism to keep her emotional wellness at a healthy high level despite her high negative emotions. After converting raw participant data into lively graphs, these four faces and their corresponding stories are brought to life. It is clear that while these graphs cannot completely prove a direct correlation, they can still elicit an easy to understand level of empathy from a viewer. Rather than just numbers on a page, these graphs draw viewers' attention to large red or green bubbles, which represent a person's real emotions over the course of 21 days. By using simple factors such as size and color, a view a viewer can empathize with the person behind the data. This relationship is what our team hoped to form between the participants and the viewers. And through the use of polar bubble graphs, we have put faces to the emotional data of people during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our experiences throughout the study have proven to us that there is still a lot to learn in relation to psychological health during a pandemic. While we can measure and quantify participants' mental health on a day-by-day -day basis, we do not know why exactly it changes the way it does. It was our goal to provide an understandable visual for this psychological information. We hope that this will serve as a tool for others to empathize with others during this crisis. We wanted to thank our advisors, Dr. Thomas Balistrieri and Professor Sarah Woden-Schwartz um, for their help over the last 14 weeks. And we wanted to thank all of you for your time. And of course, we are open to questions. Thank you to the team. Well, um, that's a very nice use of the polar bubble graph. And uh, a, uh, my question, and others may come in, is this something, the visual representation that only you saw, or do any of the participants see this tool in the same way, or is it mainly to be used as you are using it to generate empathy from a, a third party viewer, someone else? Um, so the way that we completed our project, the majority, actually all of the responses were kept as anonymous as possible. Um, so for the most part, these graphs were really for our team and then for the presentation. Um, of course, all of these will be in our report and will be posted um, and participants can see. Uh, if a participant does directly reach out to us, of course, we will share their data with them um, and show uh, their individual polar bulb graphs. Good. Gwyneth, did you have something to add too? Oh, no, I'm reading the chat. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> so so uh, there's a question um, about the number of participants or the number of respondents that you studied. Can you so of, so once we had the graph, uh, not the graph, the um, daily diary go live, we had over 120 unique respondents um, to the survey and then over 700 uh, individual responses uh, past that, uh, returning members on a day-to-day -day basis. Good. Thank you. I think what we will do now is uh, can, people can continue to ask your team questions. But we, if people have questions for some of the prior teams too, we can launch those into the survey, into uh, the chat, or people can choose to raise your hand with the um, that feature on the Zoom um, toolbar, um, or just unmute yourself. And uh, but first, let's say thank you to this team. The many cases of COVID. So go again and ask you a question which has come in. Did you track people's emotional state against the backdrop of the news and whether it was good or bad news? That was my dad. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a good question. Um, we did. Um, the, the difficult thing about um, tracking the news and tracking people's emotional states was finding uh, a significant cause and effect relationship. Uh, because the way we were tracking people's data was as, not, as anonymous as possible, and it was very numerical, um, it's hard to find a significant 
uh, percentage of, oh, you know, I saw this news story and that's what caused my emotional response for this day. And uh, another difficulty because I was trying to find all of these news stories and I created a timeline was that every day something major happened. Um, there wasn't kind of nothing happened this day, but then something happened the next day. There was just always something. So um, it would make people's, possibly make people's graphs kind of constant because there's just always something. This is a question for multiple teams, but I'll ask uh, this team. You had some older respondents. You mentioned someone who reacted in relation to the memories of the Vietnam War. Now, some of many of the earlier presentations had a focus on students or of uh, say younger generation. Did you or the for the other teams find any correlations among age and response to some of the things issues you were investigating? Uh, that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, the majority of our respondents were between the ages of uh, 18 and 27, um, but the age ranges did span from 18 to 78. Um, in terms of uh, different ways that different ages responded, um, it was very hard to uh, group these, uh, we, we call them profiles, the, the polar bubble graphs, um, to a specific demographic group. Um, that is where the second half of our research was focused with demographic groups, um, because we did collect information on that, um, but we didn't see a, any direct correlations. Do you have a question, Professor Shockey, for this or any other team? I, I was really just going to say that I, I just appreciate so much that these teams unlike um, many of the teams that were able to maintain their original connection from ID 2050 have pivoted just elegantly with all of these projects. And um, I know that that was not easy for anybody. So um, I, I don't have a question. I just want to make that observation. I know there's some other advisors in the room, uh, myself among them, and I would second in that and third that. I think that, uh, the the work we've seen today is, is truly impressive given everything that's gone on. So it's not just emergency online teaching, but emergency online project work. And so we've all been navigating new territory. And I, the, the presentations today have really been uh, impressive in the way that everyone's been able to pull this work off. If, if I may add also uh, to, uh, to chime in, I, what I was really impressed by is that despite the, uh, all the setbacks, emotional, um, you know, social, all of that, I think the quality of projects, and I have advised a whole lot of them, I, I don't think it suffered. I think that the analytical strength of presentations were, were, was there. In, in, in force, and uh, I am just wondering whether it's our WPI students' resilience, their acumen for problem solving, um, uh, the lack of uh, distraction, but I am really impressed with the quality uh, of projects. So bravo to everyone. There's a question for all groups that's come into the chat. Um, Tragedy of 9-11 united us as a country against a common enemy. Why do you believe that we as a country are as fractured today against this common enemy, the COVID-19 disease, we'll say. Any thoughts from the teams? Could you um, define, I guess, what you mean by fractured? Like, are we divided against this this issue, or I'm confused by that word? Well, maybe a different way of asking this is, um, if you were to look at the news, there's a kind of polarization in in the country around some political issues, 
and th that polarization has influenced how people are responding to the pandemic. And so the question for the teams might be, did you see evidence of that kind of polarization yourself in some of the, the interviews, the surveys, the responses, the, the work that you did, you know, did, was the dairy industry looked at differently from different sides of a political aisle, for example, or, um, you know, were people raising political issues in their daily di or weekly diaries that were in the many faces of COVID project. Um, um, uh, slightly uh, unrelated to our project in general, but just observations, you know, as we kept up with the pandemic throughout the term, uh, I certainly believe that the different places that people receive their information from, uh, the different media outlets, uh, definitely um, polarize uh, how people are responding to this pandemic. And I also believe that the lack or like unclearness of a uniform response has left people to search on their own for how they want to deal with the situation best. And in reality, it might've been better for us to all gather under, you know, one set of protocols that we wanted to follow. And I think we would have been able to come at this better together as a country. I have an answer sort of related to that, just based on how our project interviewed people from around the globe, because it was very interesting to see the perspectives on what should be done about it, depending on someone's location. So within the US, there was a strong geographic trend of people who lived in states such as Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, were very concerned about the virus, very supportive of any policies, um, putting restrictions into place, in hopes of mitigating the spread. Meanwhile, people in states such as South Carolina, Utah, and Hawaii were much less concerned and much more, not necessarily against, but sort of questioning the purpose of certain restrictions. And I also noticed that sort of questioning when it came to my interviewees from other countries. For example, I interviewed someone from Indonesia where most beaches are still open. A lot of restaurants are still open. Um, they were um, almost confused by how the rest of the world is sort of dealing with this, I think just because there's been such less density of cases there. And then it was interesting to interview someone from Germany where they've done extremely well by locking down in some ways more strictly than us, in other ways not as strictly, and now are beginning to open up. For example, the person I interviewed, when I mentioned that uh, in many US states, cancer screenings, heart surgeries, et cetera, have been stopped or put on hold, uh, my interview was shocked. Uh, she was almost scared by that. Like, how could you do that? How could you stop doing that? So there's definitely across the world a variety of perspectives, and some people definitely yeah, are very concerned about which restrictions exactly are put into place, while others are more accepting and supportive of what's going on. Yeah, I think also like a lot of our, participate, our participants echoed that confusion with like what's going on. And I also think in events like the tragedy of 9-11, it's just so clear that like someone caused this, it was wrong, like this is a tragedy. You know, in the case of a pandemic, there's less, you know, it's less easy to blame someone. Like people can be upset that things are canceled, but there's no one to kind of point the finger at. So I think like there's just confusion about what's happening all over the world. There's misinformation. I believe one group even talked about how you know, case numbers may be underreported based on like lack of testing and stuff like that. So I think, yeah, like a lot of just confusion between, you know, a non-unified response, you know, Florida, you know, having beaches open and then other places completely shut down definitely leads to kind of maybe, you know, misunderstanding of what's happening. There's some comments in the chat that we might bring out into the audio here where the question was asked, were there cases where the pandemic was seen as a positive influence? This was particularly regarding the last presentation, I think. And um, Gwyneth Zelmano answers um, that some did see their wellness increase. So if anyone else wants to comment about, because you have multiple perspectives and we'll call a longitudinal um, 
you know, different points of the last two months where you've uh, found people's opinions? Do you see some ways that the pandemic is being seen to be a, have a positive influence or in uh, some terms like that? Bruce, is your hand up? But anyone can can join. Yeah. Yes, it is, Peter. I'm 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 trying to get my video back, but uh, it's uh, I've been disabled. Um, I just wanted to join in with the uh, comments that that uh, oh, host has asked me to start my video. There we go. Uh, uh, join in with the, the uh, comments of the other advisors and just really congratulate all of the teams for um, coming up with uh, with spectacularly interesting. Uh, projects on very short notice. Their overall resilience. We've, you know, Peter and I have talked to our teams and saw the uh, the original sense of, of, I'd say, bitter disappointment on March fourth when uh, when the, the decision was made, and we met with the students the next night, um, not knowing how this was all going to play out. And uh, I think today is really a, a celebration of of student resilience and. Uh, just uh, the opportunity to find out how to work in teams in a completely different setting on a completely different project. But other than that, easy peasy. So congrats all around. Um, so just to, to go back to that question, um, for me personally, uh, I spoke to someone in Houston, Texas, where they do a lot of oil refinery um, and he had he had noted that there was definitely a visible improvement in the air quality um, and I think that sort of uh, uh, information has been backed up by more scientific data now where countries are saying that you know there's reduced emissions in a lot of big cities. And um, so people are, you know, taking a note of that and realizing that there are, um, you know, obviously the pandemic isn't a positive in, of, in and of itself, but because of it, we are able to reevaluate some of the, the things we do in society and maybe um, realize that we have priorities that weren't fully addressed previously that we now want to look more carefully at. Yeah, to add to Alex's point, um, more than I guess um, I thought that people would, um, they really talked about um, like the environmental implications of a pandemic. Um, like several people talked about how they hope this draws attention to climate change, you know, we have this huge national reaction to an emergency. You know, can we do the same with climate change? Other people said, you know, like the skies are clearer, you know, less commuting, uh, they save time, you know, there there's less traffic and that kind of thing. So it was interesting that people made that, you know, positive connection and I didn't expect so many of them to make that sort of connection. Anyone else have any thoughts that they'd like to share? <clears throat> In this case, it will fall to me to thank all of the teams uh, for their presentations, to thank the advisors for their work. Um, it's been a pleasure to listen to all these stories because your pandemic stories are, are part of this. And as one of the um, projects you know, highlighted on the initial slides says, we will be talking about this for years. And so um, it's I've been a delight to be part of this. And uh, I see some thanks that are being coming out in the, to the comments, but I'd really like to, to thank everyone for coming to participate and uh, look forward to hearing more about your stories in the future years. So thank you very much and uh, good luck with the rest of the, surviving the pandemic as we all find our new normal. <laughs>